and welcome to this week's edition of the Scottish Independence Podcast. This week we have another episode from the TNT Show with guest Professor Shona Douglas-Scott. Shona is a former Professor of European and Human Rights Law at Oxford and she joins our host John Drummond to talk all things constitutional. Very laid back conversation but actually very interesting so hope you enjoy this one. Hello, good evening, and welcome to the TNT Show. I'm John Drummond, and I'm your host. Well, tonight we're talking to a very special guest. We'll be discussing constitutions, Scotland, independence, United States, and so much more besides with constitutional expert, Professor Shona Douglas-Scott. Now, Shona is here for a full hour, and she'll be taking your questions. So, TNT stands for The Nation Talks. So in many respects, this is your show. Now, to our guest tonight, The Nation Talks to Shauna Douglas-Scott. Thanks for joining us, Shauna. How are you and where are you? Well, thank you very much for having me on your programme, John. And I'm currently actually in the United States, uh, where I'm on research leave in New Hampshire, actually, in New England, uh, where we're five hours behind you. And it's very, very uh, wet at present, but I think we're going to have some snow later. <laughs> I gather there might be snow in Glasgow soon, so, yeah. uh, and I'll be in Glasgow on, on Saturday. I'm going there for our clan. We have a clan lunch every year. The Drummonds get together en masse. Shona, it's a great delight, and we're deeply honoured that you're able to join us tonight because the Constitution reflections on what happened in 1776 or thereabouts in the United States, and also the whole business of the Supreme Court. When you reflect over these matters, what are your initial thoughts? Well, I think what, what's quite interesting is the fact that the British Constitution has always been rather vague and unclear. And I've been doing some research on the loss of the British colonies in North America uh, over 200 years ago. And what's interesting is that in some ways you can see a similar pattern of behavior from what has taken place really from the UK um, government and center in London now regarding Scotland. Um, Because back in the mid 18th century, the UK Parliament imposed various taxation on the US colonies, and it wasn't at all clear that it had any right to do that whatsoever. Um, There were, if you like, sort of two different views of, of how the British Constitution functioned. And I think what's interesting is that today you get a different view of how the British Constitution is functioning, what makes it up um, from the centre in London, and from Scotland and um, other areas, other nations of the UK, which are more willing to look at some sort of split sovereignty, which is certainly what the US colonists were looking at. So there's one view in London, which doesn't necessarily have all the weight of opinion behind it, all the weight of scholarly study. I mean, it's actually quite an arguable case. And I think that's what's interesting is that you don't even have to be a supporter of Scottish independence or a unionist to see that there are problems with the British constitution arguing how it works because it's always been this rather inchoate, if you like, this rather ephemeral body. And it's never been completely clear um, how what it consisted of. But don't don't you feel that the Supreme Court has actually clarified things? Or do you feel that the Supreme Court judgment that actually muddied the waters. What's your take on that? Um, Well, I I found the Supreme Court judgment to be unsurprising, and I think I have that in common with quite a few commentators. What they did was to look at the 1998 Scotland Act on devolution and to say, if we go through this act, uh, we don't think that you have sufficient competence to hold a referendum in the Scottish Parliament. 
Um, I think actually there was an arguable case over that. It wasn't as clear cut as maybe uh, a unanimous opinion of five judges in the UK Supreme Court made it seem. I think there was definitely an arguable case, but they decided that. And I, I think it wasn't surprising, partly because if you look at how the UK Supreme Court has acted in the past, who are the judges on it, what they decide. Uh, in 2021, they decided two cases um, on Scottish devolution um, concerning the incorporation of the UN rights of the child, for instance, into Scottish law. Back in 2018, they decided the Scottish Continuity Bill case. And all of those, they took quite a narrow approach to devolution. So it wasn't really very surprising to see what they did. Uh, but I have to say that this present Supreme Court, with Lord Reid as the president, and of course he has a Scottish background, Scottish training, but he does seem to have in some ways quite a, a un-Scottish, as it's been put by a former colleague of mine, Conor Goethe, um, a dedication to parliamentary sovereignty, and that means Westminster parliamentary sovereignty. And that hasn't helped Scotland at all in this case. We have a, a saying on this this program that trying to define the British Constitution in a sentence mm -hmm. that it consists of uh, the British Constitution is whatever the government of the day, with a working majority, says it is. Yeah. Well, yeah. there's quite a lot to that because quite a lot of the British Constitution um, is not legally binding. So it consists of political conventions and customs, um, things that are not binding. And so the government and their officials, which used to mean civil servants and these days tends to mean spads and people that are you know, only there for a few months and then they're in the House of Lords or whatever, uh, but the constitution is what they say it is. And I think one of the good illustrations of that is the Sewell Convention, that the um, UK, the Westminster Parliament, should only legislate with the should only normally legislate with the consent of the devolved parliaments, um, that was not treated as legally binding by the UK Supreme Court, despite having been legislated, having been written into um, the Scotland Act 2016, it was still treated as being a political convention. And when you have a constitution that's made up of so many political customs, conventions, usages, then it's very, very unclear what it actually is. And in my research, what I found out was that this has been the case for so long with the British Constitution. If we go back to the 18th century. It was very much like that then. And that was partly the problem and the argument with the American colonies. But also throughout the British Empire, when Britain claimed to rule over up to a quarter of the globe, um, that was also the case then. Um, there was never anything like a Napoleonic code. There was never any set of legally binding rules. There were all these usages and customs that applied. Uh, but on the other hand, the UK government has preferred to move back to some sort of legal notion of sovereignty when it suited it. But that sovereignty is very contested. So you might say that actually it looks more like pure brute power sometimes. Therefore, isn't it altogether, it's not altogether surprising the Supreme Court came to the judgment it did because it's a creature of the British yeah. Constitution. And if the British Constitution effectively is whatever the government of the day says it is, then the Supreme Court must surely uh, abide by what it thinks the wishes of the government are. Well, I think you have to be careful when you're saying that. I, the, the Supreme Court has, has you know, various powers and um, since two, 2005 and the Constitutional Reform Act, now that was legislation that was promoted by the Labour government when the UK Supreme Court came into being, but it went through Parliament, it went through both the House of Commons and the House of Lords, and we also have this thing called the independence of the judiciary in the UK, mm. um, whereby we hope and we expect that our judges will be thoroughly independent of political forces. And that includes government forces. And one of the reasons why the UK Supreme Court came into being was to take it out of the former legislative chamber, the House of Lords, and to distinguish it from uh, the legislature, to distinguish it from the and this other organ of the state. So it was a separation of powers uh, point. So we have to be a bit careful there. 
On the other hand, the Supreme Court, with its devolution jurisdiction, has only been in operation since the, the, the Scotland Act. There was a rather confused phase when the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council actually decided some de devolution issues for a while. Um, so in some ways you can say, yeah, it couldn't have come into being. It's a creature of statute. It couldn't have come into being if somebody hadn't drafted that legislation and got it through Parliament. On the other hand, we do have this doctrine and we believe in that our judges should be independent. And we have a Judicial Appointments Commission that was set up since um, the early 2000s that's supposed to ensure that. Now, you could still say, well, there are problems with that. Our judges are not as independent as we would like them to be, but there has been some sort of attempt to make them so. The, the reason I raise the point about its, its independence is that you make the point that it's a, it's a creature of a, a, an act, legislation approved by both houses, but surely that also applies to the Sewell Convention, which was also approved by both houses. And yeah. cast aside in the way you describe. That's right. Well, that is a very, very critical issue. I agree. I mean, I think it's one thing to say it's a convention um, that should be applied as a political practice, which was the case before the Scotland Act 2016. It's another to specifically write it into a statute and then say, well, it's still just a political convention. Yeah. Well, it, it, as a lay person, I find it exceptionally difficult to understand that mm -hmm. it doesn't bolster a lot of confidence amongst lay people about the Supreme Court, I have to say, if it, if it can blithely disregard uh, laws that it chooses to disregard. Well, I, I just don't understand how some laws remain conventions and some laws are absolutely uh, one is hidebound to, to, to observe. I just don't understand the difference. Yeah, well, I guess the Supreme Court would probably say that they were not blithely disregarding laws, but they were reading it in its context, and that's how they interpreted it. But it is, it is very, very difficult to fathom. It has to be said there are very, very few conventions that have been written into Acts of Parliament like that. So this was a very exceptional case, and it's quite hard not to feel quite aggrieved at that particular interpretation that was given. And by the way, the Sewell Convention is just the continuation of a convention that applied for many, many years, hundreds of years, in the context of the former British Empire, uh, to the Dominions, for example. Britain, Westminster was quite happy to leave Australia, Canada, New Zealand, South Africa, to their own devices, to legislate whatever they wanted. Um, with something very, very similar to the Sewell Convention applying. But they very, very rarely interfered. And I think it's quite interesting now that you have a situation where I'm trying to remember how many pieces of really important constitutional legislation have gone through Westminster without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. And very often without the consent of the Northern Ireland Assembly or Welsh Assembly either. That is something new, and it indicates um, what Peter Hennessy has called as the, the, the demise of the good chap's theory of government, that you cannot trust those in power to abide by political practices that they always used to abide by in the past. And also it requires the institutions to sympathetically respond to that approach. I mean, the civil servants and others, and... Again, speaking as a lay person, there is a sense that the institutions have been compromised. Yeah. Yeah. And it's difficult to know what the constitution is, yeah. if the pillars upon which it rests, i.e. the yeah. institutions, yeah. Uh, appear to be compromised. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, the British constitution was always described as a political constitution in the past because so much of it was not set out in law and acts of parliament, but in these conventions and usages. And then it was very dependent on people standing by them, by uh, observing them. And that has not been the case so much recently. Uh, although, on the other hand, again, we have to be a little bit careful here because we go back a um, hundred years in time, um, and we can look at civil servants and who was making up civil servants and who was making up the judiciary. They all knew each other very well in the past. <laughs> and so there was sort of an old boys, and it was boys in those days, club going on then. So I think one shouldn't look through too much through rose-tinted spectacles. It is an interesting point, though, because 
if the notion is that the constitution worked because there was a common ethical or moral view yeah. amongst those who held power, if that moral view point is no longer acceptable to many people, then it means that the constitution itself, whatever form it takes, is in some jeopardy. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think that that nicely summarizes the situation we're in right now. Um, that you, if you're going to have a political constitution where an awful lot of it is not in acts of parliament and hard and fast law, but in usages and customs, then you have to have people who are going to respect that, who are running government. And if they don't, then you are in a, a serious situation. And I think that is very much where we are now. And I think Brexit revealed that quite clearly. Uh, but I think that some of the moves in Scottish independence have also revealed that the, the Sewell Convention being ignored in quite a lot of legislation in Westminster is a good example of that. Yeah, my question drew up on my experience in working with major corporations in the field of business ethics. And they asked us as advisors to come in, Shell, many others, uh, to take a look at the issues that were arising, which they felt they weren't able to deal with immediately. And one of the, the matters that we uncovered was individual employees have difficulty if they hear mixed messages from the top. Mm. They need consistency and they need to feel there is a moral imperative behind what they do. And, uh, and I'm not choosing any particular company in, in mind when I say this, but while there was a dissonance, it led to people assuming that, for example, all that was important was profit. Yeah. And principles didn't really matter too much because yeah. that's the message they understood. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they got their corporations into terrible trouble because they thought they were doing the right thing, even mm -hmm. though they knew that it was wrong, <laughs> if that yeah. makes any sense. They yeah. did it because they thought that profits uh, were more important than principles. And at the end of the day, I'm afraid that's just not the case over the medium to long term. Well, I think that's right. But I would add something else. I mean, I think, I think there isn't a clear message. There isn't a clear set of ethics coming from government in, in London at present. But I think also there shouldn't be a belief that um, a country and its constitution should be run like a business. The two are not the same. And there's an awful lot of that belief at present that somehow if you have experience in business, um, running the UK should work along those lines. And that has been the case in the past. Yeah. I, I think that's right. I, I, I wasn't trying to draw that sort of panel, but no. just the, the fact that if, if the moral base is seen to be compromised, then it leads to all sorts of problems. And most of them are hidden until you they actually come, they burst into, in, into yeah. the surface, and then it's too late to deal with them. And that produces in the business environment uh, what we call corporate tragedy. The organisation eventually foundered. And yeah. I, what the panel I was trying to draw was within any large organisation, whether it be a state or whether it be some sort of yeah. corporation. I think that's right. I mean, Brexit was an obvious example of that, that after the referendum, there was a complete vacuum as to what Brexit might actually mean and how it might actually be implemented. People looked to government to, to see that, and there was just this vacuum there. Yeah, and it's, it, I found it to be very dangerous when there was a moral vacuum, mm -hmm. because what tends to happen is that nature abhors a vacuum. It gets filled very quickly. And generally by people who don't have the interests of the company or the state at heart. They have short-term interests, which yeah. they seek to satisfy. And those can be extremely dangerous if they're allowed yeah. to uh, proceed. I watch it all happening in front of me and I think, oh, more. oh no, this is, this is not good. <laughs> yeah. No, I agree. I agree. And we see that at present. Yeah. Yeah. You, you mentioned relationships between uh, the British Parliament and, I guess, its sovereign with uh, the uh, American colonies back yeah. in the mid-18th century. Uh, and you mentioned that there are some parallels there. What was it that led to the, the, the final breach, would you say, between the well, colonies and, the, and Westminster and London? Well, what I think is interesting is that it was best basically over sovereignty, uh, which we've seen a lot with Brexit and which I think we see again with the um, Scottish um, referendum in the, in the Supreme Court, question of who has the sovereignty. 
Uh, but it started with taxation because uh, Britain had fought some very expensive wars, the Seven Years' War in the middle of the 18th century, much of which took place in North America against the French and the various North American Indian tribes. And um, Britain wanted somehow to be able to fund those costs, so they started taxing their North American colonies, really for the, the first time ever, clearly. And the colonies said, well, you have absolutely no authority to do this. Uh, we have a parliament. We have our own parliaments in each of the various colonies, each of the 13 colonies. Um, and they determined that they set taxation, not you. And the situation then was frankly very unclear as to whether the UK parliament had that sovereignty or not. And in 1766, they adopted what they called a declaratory act saying, we have the sovereignty. We can pass any law whatsoever over you. Now, aside from the fact that we see parallels with that in the devolution legislation where Westminster has retained ultimate sovereignty, I think what's, what's interesting is that back in 1766, there was enough lack of clarity that they had to adopt this legislation because the position was not clear at all. It really wasn't. It wasn't at all clear that the UK Parliament had this sort of sovereignty. Um, and if you look at history, um, if you look at the situation in other parts of the Union, in Scotland, for example, um, and in Ireland as well, they had to pass a similar declaratory act over Ireland earlier in the century. That position was not clear at all. So I think there's quite a good arguable case that um, the American War of Independence was sparked by the UK Parliament asserting a sovereignty it really could not consistently, adequately, coherently justify. So then it, then it used military force to to justify, to... Yeah, and unsuccessfully, to their great surprise, they, yeah. they lost that battle, yeah. And then they sent the same people, the same generals who had lost in that war out to colonies elsewhere. I mean, Cornwallis, for example, who lost in Yorktown, was then sent out to India, where yeah. he had various important roles there. But yeah, so, the situation was not at all clear, and they insisted on enforcing that. And they were warned by um, figures like Edmund Burke, who said, you should not do this, you really should not do this. And some very famous English judges too, such as Lord Camden, who was a very famous, esteemed, very senior judge, said that this imposition on the colonies infringes natural law. We should not do it. We have no right to do it. And they still did. Yeah, well, it sort of goes back to the moral case again, doesn't it? If you start quoting natural justice, you're sort of mm -hmm. saying that there is some moral imperative there which mm -hmm. requires that people's views on their sovereignty ought to be respected. Yeah, well, on, on both sides. I, I, but I think that, yeah, I mean, the natural law case sort of tries to bring in some morals and saying that you are acting immorally regardless of whatever law you point to says. <laughs> Um, and, you know, one can still make those arguments today. The law and justice are not the same thing. Uh, something may be just but not legal and vice versa. What, what do you think the next steps might be looking down the pike, as one might say in America, to say, where are we going to be, would you say, uh, we being the UK in, say, 12 months' time? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know about 12 months. I think if we take a longer time span, which could be within the next decade, things are going to change. I mean, it is remarkable that the the, the UK Union of, of Great Britain, the United Kingdom, it, it's only just over 300 years old. Um, that is not a very old union at all. Um, so things can change. And I think that an awful lot of work needs to be done about the UK Union to convince the other nations, I mean, Scotland and Wales, but I don't, I don't know about if I would call Northern Ireland a nation as such, but because of the divided communities there, but the, the Union shouldn't be taken for granted. And I think there is a question mark over its continued existence, but how we get there and what happens, yes, it's it's a very interesting question. And it may well depend partly on what government there is in, in Westminster. Do you think that might make a difference? I do think it would make a difference. Um, I mean, if you just take, for example, the issue of the Indy Ref 2, 
I think there's been quite a lot of talk about the fact that, you know, well, why can't Scotland just declare independence? But um, the view of the SNP, as I understand it, has always been to look for a legal constitutional route to independence. And the importance of that is that if you don't have that, you don't have the recognition of the international community. Um, you can't join organizations such as the UN and NATO and most importantly, perhaps the EU, um, and you are stuck in a kind of twilight. With So that is very, very important. So I think that um, there would be a need for a government that could um, be more conciliatory, at least, than the one that we have at present. I think, well, we have this government, not much is going to happen. But I think things can change, and they can change quite quickly. Yeah, yeah. I want, I want to bounce something off you, if I may. Um, someone wrote to me recently, and because I said, what do you do in this twilight zone? <laughs> and they said, why doesn't the Scottish Parliament pass a resolution calling for the Scottish Government to open independence negotiations? Do they really need a mandate? Well, I suspect that would just be rebuffed, like everything else has been by the UK government. I think more profitable would be to work on the grassroots, to work on the political side of things, to ensure that there is a very, very large vote in favour of independence, because that is the way that things will change. That will move the international community. Uh, in Ireland in 1918, Sinn Féin won a landslide. Now, they declared independence after that. That was not recognised. But there is no doubt that the fact of that huge, huge vote for Sinn Féin had certainly affected minds. It had changed opinions in the international community and was one of the reasons why the British government wasn't willing to continue much longer and, and sign the Anglo-Irish Treaty. That would be the important thing to do. But unless I'm mistaken, it did end up in the same place it, in the short term as the colonies did i.e. The, the, the British sent troops to enforce their view, didn't they? There was an Irish war of independence um, between 1919 and uh, 21. And then very suddenly, the British government seemed to change its mind under Lord, Lloyd George. In fact, I think I've read that Winston Churchill was very, very critical of Lloyd George <laughs> over this. And I think the British government, you know, they, they couldn't afford to fight anymore. But they also realised that um, the Irish were winning the case internationally, the democratic case. And I think that that's really, really important. Is it also true to say that one of the reasons that America secured its independence was because they were able to call on the, the full-bloody support of the French? Yeah, power always helps, doesn't it? Yeah, I think you're completely right there. If the French had not joined with them, um, the good old enemy of the English, then things might have looked different. That obviously made a huge, great difference. Um, but the French were not in there earlier on when it came to what, what sparked that battle. Mm -hmm. And I think what's interesting is that the battle was about sovereignty. And sovereignty has been at the heart of the battle over Brexit. And it has been at the heart of the battle with, with Ireland and with Scotland as well. The, the thing is, how, how do you ascertain sovereignty? We, we have a question here from several people saying, what is Shona's opinion on the claim of right, perhaps being ambiguous? Um, which, which claim of right? The 17th century one? or the more recent one? Yeah, another uh, question has said, uh, the 1869 claim of right is protected for all time. Is, is that true? I, I don't know. If that's true. I don't know. I mean, there, there's 1689 claim of 1689, yeah. Which was passed at the time of the so-called Glorious Revolution and is interestingly different from the English Bill of Rights. I mean, there are quite a few pieces of legislation that I think are relevant but not determinative. Um, and I think the claim of right is one of them. Um, they all combine together to suggest that the Scottish constitution, Scottish constitutional law, looks a little bit different from English constitutional law. 
Mm. Even if it's the case, and I don't believe it is, that parliamentary sovereignty was well established in England by the early 18th century, I don't think it was in Scotland by then. And there's no reason to suppose that the new United Parliament of the United Kingdom, after the both Acts of Union by 1707, should just take on English characteristics. So I, I think that, um, as indeed Lord Cooper said in McCormick and the Lord Advocate, so I think that there are quite a few resources one can put together mm. to make a good case that the Constitution, if you take into account Scottish resources, is not just that that's being argued as straightforward parliamentary sovereignty. It just doesn't work that way. It is interesting because it, it, it suggests that that, there is a moral case for looking at a different perspective on sovereignty. Yeah. And uh, I guess you could argue if, if a majority view is that they accept that moral case. I mean, for example, people find it difficult to understand. Do you think it's fair that England can leave the United Kingdom but Scotland can't? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is that true, by the way? Is that is that the case in your understanding? Well, I mean, given the huge majority of um, MPs and voices uh, that England has, I mean, because there is always going to be this disparity, um, England is always going to make up the huge amount of the voices in the United Kingdom. Yes, it probably could be achieved. And um, it, it's quite interesting because from what I understand, and I may be wrong, but the former Czechoslovakia, uh, there was never a referendum there. Um, politicians agreed it. But one of the reasons I understand they, they agreed it was that the Czechs just got fed up of being linked to the Slovaks. So that that, that might be one way it would happen, but, but it, it isn't the way one would hope it would come about by any means. Um, I mean, in fairness, the, the, the easiest route, as you say, perhaps to independence, if that's going to be the wish of the majority, would be uh, for there to be a negotiated settlement of some kind, like there was in Czechoslovakia, where yeah. people sat down and said, this is your bit, this is our bit, this is what we agree to share, this is what we feel that we want to apportion differently, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Well, I have difficulty seeing how it could come about any other way. Yeah. And I've come under criticism for this, but... I just cannot see how Scotland can take on all the attributes of, of nationhood, which it would certainly want and certainly deserve and ought to have, if the UK government were contesting it the whole way. There's nothing in legal terms like the Spanish constitution, which, said, which says that Spain is an entity and can't be separated. Mm. Um, there's nothing in um, case law terms like the US Supreme Court saying that uh, secession is um, illegal under the US Constitution in Texas and White. Um, but nonetheless, politically speaking, if you don't have agreement of the UK government, so many things are going to be so difficult um, that we're going back to this twilight stage again. And that doesn't do Scotland any favours. It probably doesn't do England any favours either. I, I mean, I've been arguing in my columns in the Sunday National that mm -hmm. we should mega, we should think about mega, which is make England great again. And that could only perhaps happen uh, after some form of uh, well, it doesn't. It oh. doesn't do England any favours, but one would hope that if the democratic case is made out in Scotland, then that will work for itself and, and show up unreasonableness of, of England in not taking the matter further. I mean, it's ridiculous to say that the union is voluntary and then to cut off any um, lawful constitutional route to exit. I mean, how would people have felt in the case of the EU if they'd voted for Brexit and were then told they couldn't leave? So there was just no route to it. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to see that argument as being sustainable. I mean, what, one thing has to go or the other. Either, either it's not a voluntary union. Yeah. And I think that's now a dead letter, frankly. Mm -hmm. I don't think. You know, but I was thinking more particularly in the earlier question about giving people in England the space to have a discussion about what sort of state they would like to see uncluttered, unfettered by all these appendages. Because we've got the ironic situation where the Scots and the Welsh and the Irish have all been chatting amongst themselves for decades now about what sort of state they want yeah. <laughs> and what's important to them. Um, but I don't hear anyone in England getting the chance to ventilate how they feel 
what sort of England they want. Nobody's ever asked them. It seems to yeah. me that's not right. I, I, yeah. I argue. I mean, I guess the question might be how interested are they? And some people might be very, very interested in that. But you haven't seen that sort of groundswell of opinion in the way that you have in the nations of the UK. Yeah. And when there was the referendum on the assemblies back in, what was it, 2004, for various parts of England, nobody was interested. Um, so it tends to be a rather reactive uh, sort of voicing in England. Oh, we're fed up of hearing the Scots banging on about independence again, rather than this is what we really want. Yeah. But I agree, it, it would be a worthwhile exercise. And England is very much a, a multicultural uh, country. And you'd get, I think, quite a lot of interesting answers. And if we take London, for example, hugely multicultural. Mm. Um, very, very different views on Brexit, probably very opposed to a lot of what's been going on. So, yeah, it would it would be interesting. But where, I'm not sure you'd actually get a very unified answer. I mean, it might be town versus country, for example. But you see, maybe that, maybe that all that does is reveal what already exists. Yeah. And it's healthy to do that, you, one could argue, rather than say, oh, we're going to put this surface of Englishness across everything, regardless of... Who agrees about it and doesn't agree with it? This is yeah. we're going to just obscure that there's any debate, and that doesn't seem to me to be terribly healthy. Um, um, but maybe some English would say that's already the case. I mean, there's quite a strong reaction against London um, in England, you know, in favour of the North and feeling that they're yeah. constantly being ignored, which often is the case. So there is some of that coming out. Um, but I, I don't quite know what it would lead to. And, and all of this, of course, goes together as an argument against the question of federalism, which is often put up at this stage as, well, this would be the, the solution for the UK. <laughs> but then, of course, England is too big and it's too multicultural, multidimensional to see what you can do with that. And also, nobody asked anyone in England. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, I mean, Gordon Brown is about to, I guess, restate a case for reform of the House of Lords, mm -hmm. as if you can change a little bit of the Constitution and just forget that the rest is yeah. not working terribly well, um, i.e. the electoral system would remain the same, still first past the post, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but well, you say nobody, nobody asks, but sometimes the government uses that point to their advantage. I mean, I'm thinking about the day after the first independence referendum in Scotland, 2014, when David Cameron came out, stood on the steps of 10 Downing Street and said, well, the first thing we need to think about is English votes for English laws and evil. Um, without really appearing to appreciate quite what has happened in Scotland at that time. So I think the England issue is sometimes used by UK governments to their own best interests, actually. Yeah. I'd like to move on to your book, if we may. But your, your book is about Brexit uh, and acts of union and disunion, disunion and the evolution of the British constitutional unsettlement. Yeah. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about <laughs> Sure. what the book is about? Well, um, a while back, I used to be a professor of European law, actually, European and human rights law at Oxford University. And um, when Brexit came along, I actually spent a lot of time trying to convince people that it was not a very good idea. And um, then I turned and I thought, well, this is not the first time that this has happened to, to Britain. I mean, what is very interesting is that there have been many, many acts of union and disunion in Britain's past. And although a lot of people said, well, Brexit is an expression of British nostalgia um, for the loss of empire, I think it comes to far more than that, that there's always been this lack of clarity over sovereignty. Britain's always wanted to demonstrate it's sovereign, but never been quite clear how to do that. So I took five case studies of Scotland, Ireland, the North American colonies in the 18th century, uh, the British Empire and Commonwealth and Europe. And I looked at what had happened and what the law was in those cases. Um, and it's interesting because about 100 years ago, some of the best legal minds in, in Britain were all looking at the then British Empire Commonwealth, and there was a sort of transnational law going on then. So a bit like what was going on when we were members of the EU and is still going on today. Um, but what is interesting is that there was never any clarity about it. Um, people like Dicey, who's the doyen of English constitutional law, would say, oh, the British Parliament can legislate for anything. 
but that's not written down anywhere. And uh, it wasn't at all clear. There wasn't this Napoleonic code or anything equivalent to that. So I decided to have a closer look at that and discovered, well, uh, confirmed perhaps what was my suspicion that this issue of sovereignty had always been a vexed issue. And then I looked at some other related themes like democracy, sovereignty, union, federalism, and human rights to see how they related to these case studies and how they'd been affected by them as well. Um, and I think it's, it, it, it's quite fascinating, actually, to see how much of Brexit had its roots in the past and how much, for example, of, of what is going on in Scotland today with the arguments about independence can also be compared with what was going on in the 19th century and early 20th century regarding Ireland. But constitutional memories are rather short and there's a lot of constitutional amnesia. So this tends to be forgotten. There might be a partial explanation to that. We carried a, a study, a poll, uh, a couple of three years ago, uh, a thousand people in Scotland, a thousand people in England and Wales, and we asked them what most Americans would regard as almost childlike questions about constitutions. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the sort of questions that a, an American seven-year-old uh, would be able to answer without without the hesitation. We asked, for example how many countries had a written constitution and we gave people (laughs) a list to choose from. 50% of Scots just over were aware that the United States had a written constitution. Mm -hmm. Uh, Fewer in England and Wales knew that. Only 20 odd percent were aware that Ireland has a written constitution. Mm -hmm. That was slightly less than the figure we got for France and Germany. Mm -hmm. So there isn't even, I would suggest, the glimmerings of an understanding about constitutions. And it struck me then, and it does now, that a lot of the heavy lifting that's done in educational areas in other countries doesn't take place in the UK. I mean, I I interview people on the show a lot who who know about constitutions and stuff, but uh, if I ask anyone outside of that, of what I call intelligentsia, I get a very, very different answer very confused answers. Yeah, I mean, constitutions, written constitutions are by no means panaceas, but it, it is interesting. I think there's only uh, three jurisdictions in the world, uh, Britain, Israel, and perhaps New Zealand, where a written constitution does not exist. Mm. And every country has its constitutional problems. God knows the US has had enough of them. Uh, But I think they do become more difficult if you don't have a document that makes certain things clear. Um, An an American can pull their constitution out of their pocket and it's a small document and it sets out fairly clearly what the powers of the institutions of the federal government are. Uh, But in Britain, you'd be really hard pressed at that. Incidentally, I think that was one of the problems with the EU as well. I mean, there were lots of treaties written down, but so unclear. Nobody had a clue quite what was going on. And that certainly didn't help the case yeah. for the EU either. Well, it's interesting because uh, Spain shortly have a holiday called Constitution Day. Yeah. And this is to celebrate the overthrow of the Franco dictatorship yeah. and the replacement of his legislation with a written constitution. And they celebrate that. This yeah. is important to them. They have a special day, yeah, <laughs> called yeah. Constitution Day, because it's terribly important. And the same goes with Norway and, and many other countries. We've interviewed people from Norway who sometimes, some people might say, uh, over, over-celebrate their Constitution Day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, for the US, the Constitution is a big thing. And I, taught, I co-taught a human rights course with a, an American Supreme Court judge for many, many years. And what fascinated me was how many Americans could name quite a few members of the Supreme Court. Now, that's partly, of course, because they have a strike-down power of federal and state legislation. They're very powerful. And we've seen what's recently happened with... Mm-hmm. 
um, the striking down of, of Roe and Wade in the Dobbs case. Um, but there is, hasn't been that knowledge traditionally in the UK. But if we're looking at, say, what the UK Supreme Court can do right now, then perhaps there should be more interest in the types of judges who are there. And maybe we should see it as outrageous that there's only one woman judge in the yeah. UK yeah. Supreme Court right now no ethnic minorities at all um and there were very briefly i think three women judges in the uk supreme court in 2018 or something but they had to retire pretty quickly so for about 20 years since the lady hell was appointed there's only been one and before that none so we're miles behind most other common law countries on this and these people have such tremendous power that um, I think perhaps we should know more about them and, and what they do and what their backgrounds are. I mean, I assume it would just be completely unacceptable for the US Supreme Court not to be diverse. Yeah. I think I think that's right, although in, in, in interesting ways, of course, the US Supreme Court is not diverse. Uh, I think six members of it are Catholic. Three... I'm not sure. Uh, at least one is Jewish, um, but you know, question whether you call that diverse or not. It certainly would have been diverse at one stage, but it uh, it might be with a view to uh, producing certain types of, of decisions. But yeah, in terms of male female ethnic balance, it's better balanced than the UK. I mean, I think the only notable Supreme Court that does worse than the UK is Pakistan. India does better, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, they all do better. And it's hard to imagine, too, someone sitting down to write a British constitution in the conventional way that these yeah. things are understood would have difficulty accepting that members of a particular religion would be guaranteed seats in the upper chamber. Yeah. Well, I think part of the problem in the US has been that these have been the nominations of the president. He's had certain ideas of what he, and it's always been a he, would like to have done, uh, and what can be got through the, the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee. Um, in the UK, it's been less overtly political but till quite recently, the Lord Chancellor had a pretty free hand in um, judicial appointments in the in the UK. It was just the tap on the shoulder, the secret soundings. It's only the last 20 years we haven't had that. And um, it's certainly taking a long time for judicial diversity to filter up to the highest level of the UK courts. When you're talking to, and I imagine you must, from time to time this must happen, you're talking to a lay audience about constitutions in the UK, what sort of reaction do you get? Well, I think there's a lot of surprise a lot of the time that things are the, the way they are. Um, can this really be the case, um, particularly with things like Sewell, for example? An awful lot of it is very, very complicated and it takes some explaining. And um, the recent Supreme Court case, for example, I think... What interested, well, interested me in a certain way was that over two, about two thirds of the judgment and an awful lot of the discussion in court was over a rather technical matter as to whether the court could decline a jurisdiction to hear the case. So the, course, the, court, the case would not even have been heard in the first place, let, let alone get beyond that. And I think that these matters are the, the sorts of things that are important but they can give lawyers a very bad name um, because you seem to be spending an awful lot of time and money on, on issues that aren't evidently important to the, the public. Sorry, are you saying that your sense is that the public don't care too much about constitutions? or that... No, I'm not saying that at all. I think they do care. I'm just saying that an awful lot of it is incredibly technical and tricky and that sometimes when um, lawyers get to it, it can seem a bit pointless but there are some really really key important issues there and people do care about them they care about them deeply but having um, an uncodified british constitution 
doesn't really help because if if somebody's trying to point to something and say yeah well this is the ground i'm relying on and i'm not a lawyer by training they haven't got a codified constitution they can look at and say well why can't we follow that they've got a huge amount of resources various sources some legal some not and how can anybody how can lawyers find their way around that it's really difficult and it's always justified as being historical it's been that way it's evolved uh, well, that's fine if you're one of the people who know how it's evolved and you've been in on it. Um, but if you haven't, I think it's quite difficult to to follow, to understand why it should be this way and not another. It does seem arcane to many people looking from the outside, and if not to say very, very odd uh, indeed. We're running a wee bit short of time. Is there anything you would like to touch upon, Shona, that you feel we haven't? properly uh, addressed or discussed tonight? Well, there's just one thing that came to mind during the last point that you made, which is about the Constitution and people's understanding of it. And the point I was going to make was that if Scotland were to become independent, I'm pretty certain it would have a codified written constitution. It wouldn't go down this uncodified route. And that tells you something. (laughs) Yes, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the 2014 a paper that was produced by the Scottish government, in fact, made specific reference to yeah. an interim constitution. That's right. Yeah, I, I know that because I helped to to write mm-hmm. it with Elliot Bulmer, but uh, it's just disappeared. I have no idea uh, what's being planned just now, except that there's a document out for discussion. I gather. Well, that seems to be the sensible thing to do because you don't want to write it in advance. But on the other hand, then you're stuck with nothing. So to have some sort of interim constitution would seem to make a lot of sense. And also it would be, in my humble opinion, immensely reassuring to people who are not supportive of any constitutional change that that constitutional change would take a particular form yeah. Uh, yeah. and their rights would be uh, safeguarded and protected. And yeah. it seems to me that's a terribly important argument, yeah. if nothing else. Yeah. Uh, and also it's important, it seems to me, for all states to make it clear what they stand for and what they will not stand for. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm pretty certain parliamentary sovereignty wouldn't be in it either. (laughs) (laughs) Well, perhaps we'll go back to the claim of right that said (laughs) that uh, we we can throw out our governments any time we wish. I think the argument about about politicians being a bit like nappies, they (laughs) change frequently for much the same reasons. Uh, is a, is a good, is a good, no, we've certainly had a lot of change of prime ministers recently. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that was just the safety pin and not the nappy itself. But who yeah. knows? <laughs> Look, this has been uh, fascinating, Shona. First of all, may I say how kind it is of you to uh, take the trouble to uh, to join us, uh, particularly over this long distance. But well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really very, very honoured to have been. It, it was a, it was a great pleasure. Thanks for listening to Scottish Independence Podcast. We'll be back again next week with another episode. And if you'd like to catch up on any that you've missed, check out our website, which is podcasts.independencelive.net, where you'll find our previous episodes and also our blog. Bye now. Bye.